All right, I'd like to call the meeting to order. 702, can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moment of silence, please. Thank you. And you do know the football I do, the Jets, absolutely. Um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of 11 one, 10, please? And, and yes. Do I have a second to it, please? Failure to have a second means we can't open it for discussion and vote. Thank you, Lori. Any amendments or changes, corrections? I don't think that I voted no on the vote of that meeting. For which, okay. You didn't vote no on, well, on yeah, the, we, uh, we made up your mind for you. Didn't you get that notification? <laughs> if it's possible, I would like to change that to the yes vote because I think that's okay. what my thought was that night. So what does that change the vote come to? I know. Well, it would be whether it was, it was a five yes, one okay. no, one abstention. Okay. I just had to make sure that it wasn't going to change the outcome of whether no. the motion passed or not. No, it makes no difference to anything other than okay. the message. Any other amendments or corrections? All right. We're talking oh. about the 15th, correct? Mm -hmm. No. No, no the, the first. Oh, the first? The first. Yeah. Just so you know, these were non-public minutes, but they didn't make it into the minutes because they weren't sealed, so that's why you're saying them separate. All right, all in favor of approving November 1st is, as amended. One, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, five, and four, one, two, three, four, five, six in favor. Okay, my count again. Abstentions? One abstention. Motion passes. Um, I have a motion to approve the minutes of 11:15 by Ginny, seconded by Second. by Jen, Jennifer. Excuse me. All right. Any corrections, amendments? Seeing none. All in favor of approving the minutes of 11:15. Six against. Abstentions. Uh, six. Zero, 01 motion passes. I'm going to start the correspondence folder around. It has some substitution reports as well as a letter from Diane Hathaway um, from the library talking about um, that the events and information for the library are being distributed electronically through the electronic newsletter. We've also received um, another letter from the librarian, um, the Board of Trustees for the library actually thanking us for our cooperation, the school district's cooperation with the library, and the fact that we're starting to try to work together more. And that's not in there, but I just want to bring that up. Alrighty, well, that's going around. Accommodations, good news? Yeah, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I'm going to try and go in chronological order, but um, last week on Friday, the NHS finished up their drive for the Toys for Teens, and we got actually a lot of donations, a lot of money, and a lot of toys donated. Um, to the Toys for Teens, and they're going to be delivered next Friday um, to the Toys for Us Center. Um, and then next, on Saturday, the Select Vocal Ensemble performed at several local nursing homes in Boston, in Boston and then finished out the day at a barbershop performance um, in Milford at the Hampshire Hills. And it was actually a spectacular performance by all the groups there. And um, we received a lot of donations towards our fundraiser for the grand piano, which um, we are now selling. I don't know if I have it with me. We're selling pins that have grand piano on them to try and fundraise for that. Um, the canned food drive starts today, and we already started with over 400 cans just from today. And then we had 450 cans collected last week at the Interfest. Um, and then last thing, this Friday, is the Winter Sports Madness Pet Rally at 7 to kick off the winter sports season for all the winter sports teams. Excellent. Any other accommodations good news? 
Uh, I just wanted to announce that um, Mountain View's annual Turkey Trot fundraiser or can drive. Um, got three, uh, 1,325 cans for the Garstown Food Pantry and $500 this year they sold uh, t-shirts to raise cash and they got uh, $500 to go. So those donations were made for the food pantry. Great. Um, I don't have anything for Glen Lake or Bartlett today, but um, at Maple Lab, um, we have um, started an enrichment block this year. And um, just to touch on that a little bit, our enrichment block is offered daily to all students for 30 minutes. Um, our focus is on, on enhancing literacy using concepts and strategies from Reading Street. Uh, we have, uh, teachers have grouped the students in threes and we've formed a grade level cluster. Uh, teachers meet uh, once a week to discuss uh, and plan what we're going to be doing for the following week. We, the students are grouped and regrouped by reading ability based on reading street assessment data and classroom performance. Our most struggling learners receive intense targeted literacy instruction by a reading specialist or special education teacher. Large student groups rotate to a different classroom every six weeks with um, the end of each literacy unit. So we'll actually be starting a um, a new rotation next week. Uh, it's great, I know first and second grade, um, they've done some plays in some of their classrooms. Um, third grade, we've tried integrating a lot of science, um, writing paragraphs, going over that, some Venn diagrams. We have uh, an on-site field trip this Thursday, Eyes on Owls, so we've been working on doing some pre-teaching on what the kids are going to be experiencing <coughs> on Thursday. So it's been a lot of fun, kids enjoy it. So is it, I'm just curious, is it fair to say that this dovetails very nicely with RTI so that, so that the, the students who are struggling are getting their interventions during that time frame and at the same time um, there's an enrichment for um, all students, be they RTI or, or um, at the top of the curve? That is correct. Absolutely. Terrific. That is correct. And we're doing that at Bartlett as well. Excellent. I just have one thing. Um, wanted to let you know, wanted to update the board. The future business leaders, the folks that did the babysitting last year, we're in process and I think we're going to be fully staffed for both the Wednesday night and the Saturday Excellent. sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Just to go along with uh, what Peggy offered, it was it came up at the CNE meeting and I won't steal all the thunder about reporting for the CNE meeting, but I just got very excited about the fact that um, it was the students learning opportunities were being focused on student abilities at certain points in their curriculum um, which got me thinking if there was it, it could be a cost savings mechanism if there were a way to group students similar learners more often and then targeted resources could be streamlined and better focused it just seems like an kind of <coughs> obvious, <laughs> um, like in a hospital where you don't put your newborns in with your med surge patients, you, you target the, the groups that need the like services, and it just seems to make sense from a fiscal standpoint. Anything you want to share with that? No, I just, I, th I think the, that was one of the main reasons why we added that 30 minute of kind of we put 90 minutes for reading um, instruction and that 30 minutes for instructional so that everybody was getting something, whether high or low. Um, I don't think I'm absolutely at no point saying I I'm a proponent of, of single level <coughs> classing, particularly at the elementary or middle school, um, because I think the, low, the lower kids learn so much from those higher kids and vice versa. So, um, but certainly for remediation, that absolutely works. Yeah, actually studies have been done to do a uh, heterogene um, heterogeneous classroom rather than homogeneous classrooms because um, we used to do that in the Gosnell school system you could probably find studies supporting both sides yeah. Yeah. so I, just, I think at elementary level to to push a kid and say you are the low end is not a great thing to say in second grade no, I, targeting a yeah. kiddo and saying I don't think that would be done but I'm excited about the way yeah, it's happening absolutely. I think it's a great laugh. thing what's happening mm -hmm. absolutely all right we're actually jumping to public comment. We actually have some children here that want to speak to the board. Um, 
So you may speak, but you, when you when you want to talk, you need to announce your name. Who would like to go first? Your name is Sarah Allard, for the record. Um, I have two letters that two students on my team gave me. And the first one is, the reason we should have recess is because we don't get energy out than we should be. And in class, if we have too much energy, then that time that you save from not going outside, you think you're getting more time for class. But since we have so much energy, he might be losing class. Think about it. Amber Davis. Yeah, just, just for the boys know, on one of our agenda items is on new business, we're discussing success recess versus um, instructional time. You need to announce your name. Casey Couples. Okay. Dear the, school, the Board of School, we sixth graders need all of our recess because we need fresh air. Some people never go outside when they're at home. Recess is important to those people. Also, this is our last year of recess, and stopping it now will make the whole town upset. You don't want to have the whole town hate you, do you? Well, that's definitely something to think about, and I'm not joking. The town will hate you. Seriously, it's unreasonable. Jenna McNeil. Is there any personal things that you two would like to share? Um, and at lunch and recess, I only get to see one of my friends because she's in a different team. And I only see her during lunch and recess. And if you don't have recess, then I don't really get to see her because I can't go there any other time. And at lunch, we're eating. And by the time the line's over, I don't really get to talk to her. Anything you want to share, Casey? No, not really. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is Thank there you. any other public comment tonight, Donna? <laughs> Donna Pennard, 65 Riverview Park Road, lifelong resident of Gonstown. Um, I'm sure the superintendent will report to you tonight that recently a grievance was run, won by the teachers. Um, I had the opportunity over Thanksgiving break to speak to a retired teacher in Massachusetts who had been formerly um, president of the Massachusetts Teachers Union. She mentioned 12 different grievances in her town alone out of seven towns that Jim Hunt was in in Massachusetts. One of those 12 grievances that were filed were all won. All pertains to teachers receiving bad reviews that were put in their file. And one of those teachers that received that was the Massachusetts Teacher of the Year the year before. So you're going to be making decisions soon based on new contracts for principals. I don't see any room for growth here. The same things that happened in Massachusetts have been repeated in the town of Goffstown. Massachusetts, he was there one, two, or three years in the seven towns that he worked in. I'm just hoping that we can get smart and see that he wasn't vetted properly five years ago and vet him properly now. This union te retired teacher is willing to talk to anyone. Um, if you would like her number, name and number, she will be talking to prominent citizens in this town. There will be articles written. If you would like that information firsthand rather than secondhand, just let me know and I'll give you the number. Thank you. Seeing there's no other public here, we'll close the public comment section. I'm going to jump right down to standing committee reports. <coughs> Admin and finance. Hey. Thank you. I'd like to. Uh, Bring forward the uh, two million eighty-five thousand three hundred eighty-one dollars and ninety-eight cents in the benefit. Do I have a second to that motion, please? Failure to get a second. Awesome. Thank you, <laughs> Diane. <laughs> All right. You're gonna have to run down the highlights of it. Yeah, some of the majors. There's an awful lot of them. Uh, two payrolls totaling nine hundred ninety-six thousand. Payroll tax of three hundred twenty thousand, sixty-eight thousand for uh, special ed, which consisted of uh, forty-one thousand to Crotchet Mountain, nine thousand three hundred to the Seacoast Learning Center, uh, eighteen hundred to uh, Lighthouse School, totaling uh, sixty-eight thousand there. Uh, Regular education transportation was 9800 
uh, <coughs> SAU allocation 113,000 for oil was 24,000 BS BSNH 20,000 the Gulfstown uh, can't read my own writing sewer was 7,000 <coughs> And the bond refunds. The Vine Millet Met got uh, 15,000. Moody's Investment got 9,600. And Wells Fargo got 40,000. Moody's was the uh, credit analysis for our uh, refunding. And uh, Wells Fargo was the last uh, interest payment on the bond. Uh, and, and just in, in fairness, to put those particular bond-related costs in context, the savings that were articulated at the hearing uh, and as follow-up to the issuance of the bond were uh, $580,000, and those were net of those costs. Right, were they? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> no, no, I, I, again, I, it's... It, it seemed to me that, that that's the first time that we had them scrolled up in that fashion. Yeah. Um, and those are sizable expenditures. Yeah. Uh, and it's important to understand what we got for those yeah, expenditures. Yeah, you guys. Ten, tenfold. Right. And uh, another item is our food service coordinator, boss, Megan. She would like to uh, have some time, probably the next meeting, to give a report on the uh, the whole food food service uh, agenda, if you wish, uh, specifically on breakfast prices, all food prices, make recommendations on changes, updates. Fill you in on the whole the whole system, um, which I don't think has ever been done before. So we don't forget to do a vote. Anybody have any other questions on the manifest? All right. So we have a motion on the floor to approve the manifest for two million eighty-five thousand three hundred eighty-one dollars and ninety-eight cents. All in favor. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. And there's a, there's a question on the presentation from May, uh, Megan. Is it going to be for the entire board or just the A and F? Entire board. Okay. And she'd like to do it at the next meeting, which would yeah. be the twentieth. Yeah. She's been doing a lot of work, and she's got some recommendations, particularly on our breakfast program, which is losing money. Um, and so she's got a really good handle at this point on the financial piece of food service. So um, we thought it would be nice for the board just to get an update now that she's been here and has a good handle on kind of where things are. And she's also going to talk about some of the changes in the federal lunch program um, that are coming out and how that's what impact that's going to have on us because there's some significant things in there, such as um, I think one of the legislation pieces is no more big sales. Um, and so she's going to talk a little bit about kind of how that might impact us. So. Did they pass that base lazy? No, no more big sales. sales. That is in the on the agenda mm -hmm. for that for that bill. Don't so they know that that's how school yeah. gets their State money. Level? <laughs> federal. Federal. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of significant oh. changes um, at the federal level for what the food service program may have to look like. It'll be They've significant. Got nothing better to do in Congress but worry yeah. about big sales. Make sure we're <laughs> they want to make sure we're healthy. Already, uh, HR Lori. Um, our next meeting is next week. Um, and we got a couple of policies coming up, but they're later on in the agenda. Okay. PNC? Um, we met tonight. Uh, we discussed um, our article content through January. Um, going forward, we are going to discuss the in kind donations um, on the various school levels. Um, the one following is planned right now to be budget oriented based on where we are with the budget process and what's going on. Um, and then following that, we should have one coming up just before deliberative that we thought would be good to just do a deliberative session overview of, of procedures and whatnot. Um, we did also address the possibility of doing uh, maybe an informative show for GTV. Um, just not permanent, but just working through this budget season as far as um, conveying information. Um, Phil has agreed to take the lead on that yes. and help. You did. <laughs> you did. 
Philip. And then Stacy and myself. When you turn, we all <laughs> voted for it. So. No, 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 no. Um, we're going to be meeting um, next Friday, not this coming Friday, but the Friday following to try to conceptualize that a bit more and, and get uh, a handle um, on that. Um, what else we did, you know, discuss, of course, is because the way our articles run, they run um, bi-weekly. So, you know, depending on the necessity of, of, you know, if there's any information and it's not our week to, to do um, an article that we could perhaps do so um, by a letter to the editor. Um, the board has in the past expressed, you know, a good disposition as far as, you know, what our articles have been thus far, and I did just want to run that by you. Um, just to find out if, if you're all good with that. It looks like the consensus on um, this consensus? half of the room is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this half's a little quiet, so. Okay. <coughs> I, I think if you can get informa correct information to people, mm -hmm. I think that's valuable. Mm -hmm. I, I would. So, see any? Um, our next meeting is Monday night. It will follow the HR meeting. Um, one of the things that is an ongoing item on that agenda will be our discussion and review of class size as, um, and that discussion really is going to uh, inform um, whether or not there's a recommendation coming out of c &E to revisit our school board policy regarding class size. Um, we had the uh, great benefit of having most, if not all, of our administrators, or certainly most. one from each school, um, with the exception of Mr. Farley, who is still healing. <laughs> I think he's back today. Yeah. Is he back today? He's back. He's back. I Good. Think today. Well, I'm glad to hear he's back. a little bit. I bet he is. I haven't seen him. I, the door was open. <laughs> and, and he's not still here, which means he can hobble out. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, item number one from the, the um, GH, GHS presentation is uh, the program of studies was brought forward. There were some language changes. There were no additions. There were some clarifications. Um, the committee uh, brought forward the program of studies with those changes um, and recommended that we adopt the program of studies and I would make that motion now for the 11-12 school year. Do I have a second to that motion by Jennifer? Anybody have any specific questions or anything you want to add to it, Phil? Again, there really no changes in classes, no reductions. Um, it really was language changes and clarifications. Um, yeah, I can say that, yeah. Yeah, what kind of language changes? Excuse me? What kind of language? More like grammar I, or I, for, uh, yeah. like understanding? For, an, for an example, we changed the title of one class. Like it was arts and crafts, and we thought it kind of gave kids the notion oh. it was like an easy class, and we changed it to and, something. And for um, instance, the... Yeah, um, to something more appropriate. There's a, there's a music ed class um, that involves the use of Sibelius. Um, if you look at the description of the class, um, it would satisfy either the fine arts requirement or the technology requirement. You may get credit for either fine arts or technology for having taken the class. You may not get credit, however, for both. Um, yeah. And again, there was a smattering of things like that. There were a couple of Graphic description arts things. turned into, I think, gaming, some sort of gaming. Right. Um, as much Maybe to do design. with marketing as anything else. You know? I think they changed well, yeah. the descriptions to better meet what was what really was actually happening. Right. And, and yes, A, happening, and, and B, um, how it had value for students in some cases. Um, if you would like, we can defer it. You can read it online. Um, uh, I'm okay. 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 All in favor of the motion? And that passes unanimously, right, Philip? Yes. Um, uh, there is an NEA S&C committee um, at the high school. Uh, it has not yet. It will meet to discuss a reevaluation of the mission statement. This is part of the charge of NEA S&C, and it w the group will simply look at the current mission statement, determine whether there are need for changes, and then we'll make recommendations going forward. Um, uh, MST. Um, continues to be a valuable asset 
for many of our students. Uh, we're using all of the budgeted slots in MST. Uh, it's a two-year program. There are occasions when somebody will not complete two years, but we're able to fill in those slots even though basically it's a two-year requirement. Um, there is ongoing work on the development of competencies. Uh, competencies simply allow students to look at the core requirements, <coughs> core competencies of a course, and may, those may be met outside of the classroom. Um, they, the number of courses in which that has occurred are fairly limited, ongoing development. Um, right now, to the extent that students are taking advantage of completing the courses through the competencies, these are students who are transfer students uh, and or students who simply can't fit the courses into their schedules. So they're finding other avenues in order to take courses, get credit for courses that they wouldn't otherwise um, be able to find time to have simply because of the structure of their schedules. Uh, and many of these students are taking seven and eight classes. Um, uh, MVMS, and you know something, because I could go on for an ever and ever, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save um, the three other, excuse me, yes, three other schools. Um, for our next meeting, if that's okay, because I literally could go on forever and ever. Um, but this is actually what we do here. Um, uh, one of the things that um, uh, MVMS has been working on is looking at what was done at, here at the high school around standardized testing and finding ways to um, look at how they've been administering standardized testing and adopt some of the practices here. Um, much of those have to do with the structuring of the schedule, excuse me, structuring of the testing, the scheduling of the testing. They've compacted it so instead of it taking place over a 10 day period, they're doing it over fewer days in a, in a much stricter schedule. Um, they're also making sure that when that testing period begins that that's what students have time and energy to focus on. So there's a no homework period during the testing. Um, people are arrive at testing having been fed, well prepared in an environment where they're ready to test. Um, the, the good news is, is that the opportunity was recognized. The unfortunate news is we aren't going to be able to report back on, <laughs> report back to you on how it worked until April? Yeah, April and May. They, they did do this on computers, yeah. right? No, oh no, kneecap oh. testing is oh, on Oh, that's hand. right. Oh, it's not? Mm -hmm. No, it's not though. Yeah, that's NWEA right. is on computers. NWEA. Um, so we'll, we can look forward to um, seeing what the benefits of some of their efforts were. Uh, <coughs> and they had tremendous support, A, within the school, and B, from the parent group as well. Um, CINE, uh, School and Needle Improvement, um, ongoing plans. They're using student performance data to differentiate instruction. Uh, one of the nice things about some of the testing is, is that you get immediate feedback that goes to both grade level expectation and strands. Um, you can look at individuals and you can look at classes. What that does is it provides the opportunity <coughs> to say, okay, if I look across 25 students, is there something that nobody seemed to get. And it allows you to hone in and focus on opportunities um, and to recognize where there may have been a gap in the presentation. Um, it also allows you to look at individual students and then look back at their um, portfolios uh, and work, then work with the RTI team at the school to develop plans for um, appropriate interventions at Tier 1, Tier 2, and or Tier 3. Um, it's it was clear to me from the report out that there is a high level of participation and integration by teachers and by the team at the school, and it's really being driven from the top down. Um, well, we talked about RTI. Um, the schedule in the day, again, has been structured to maximize the opportunities. As you said, you're doing at Maple Ave, um, 
there are times when everybody gets enrichment. Now, for some students, that enrichment is uh, response to intervention tier two. For other students, it's pushing them as far as they are capable um, and beyond their grade level because simply that particular student has the capacity. So they're finding ways to meet the needs and differentiate instruction um, using the schedule. Let's see. Um, there are ongoing meetings um, between the administration and the teams on a monthly basis. Um, there clearly is a high level of ownership in the institution uh, and it looks like they are collectively moving forward. Um, and I'll bring more to you on the other three schools next time around. Um, but here's the, the great takeaway from this is that everybody <coughs> vertically and horizontally um, understands that there are common goals and seems to have a strong vision of how we can best support our students. And, and we'll see you on Monday. Right, we have the SAE budget hearing tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, in the Boston Central School. So I need to remind everybody of that. Uh, superintendent's report. Yeah, uh, just a couple things. Um, I'm sure some of you have read um, the state approved some educational um, jobs funding. Um, if you recall, the state got um, a couple billion dollars. Um, at first, we thought the majority of it was going to go to adequacy. What they've determined to do at this moment in time, and I believe it's the way it will go because we've gotten all the paperwork for it, but half of that money will be will go towards adequacy. Half of that money is being sent to districts directly um, to help support keeping jobs and maintaining jobs. So Goffstown is actually receiving $224,000. $243.26 in ed jobs funding. And is, is that a one-time and must be expended? It is a one-time must be expended by the end of next school year. 11-12. Um, 11-12. So at this point, um, my recommendation is just to hold on that and make some decisions as we go through the budget process and determine how we want to spend that money. Um, we know it can be spent either this year or next year. We don't have to make a decision at this point. Um, but it, that is money that right now is available for us. I have a question. Um, when are we going to know for sure that this is what they're doing? Well, we've got the memo. January, right? So we've got, I mean, it's, uh, I've got the information, and we've had to submit the information for adequacy already to them. We had to do that by December 6th. So we've submitted our adequacy side because we have to give them salary and benefit information for that. Um, they've given us all the dollar amounts, they've given us all the information, so unless they change something holistically, I, that would, I don't have an answer for that. Um, at this point, we've gotten the information, we've gotten the budget dollars, we've gotten the process. Um, so if they were to pull it at this point, um, I, I, I couldn't predict when the, or if they would do that. Is it, is it so constrained as to um, be dedicated only for salary dollar use? Yes, salary and benefits okay. for salary any staff, salary or benefits for any okay. staff person. But, but to, the, to the extent that it was used to fund an existing position, mm -hmm. um, once it was gone, it's gone, it would need to be funded again. Correct. So, so if there was an existing staff <coughs> member um, who was essentially paid with those dollars, the need to fund that position wouldn't go away. Correct. If it was a current in the staff, future. if it was right, okay. if it was a current staff person. And is it a reimbursement type of format where we have to submit and get reimbursed, or are they going to dispense the money? It's usually always a reimbursement. We submit the expenditures through the online grant <coughs> pro management program, and mm -hmm. they submit. They give us back. And do the they money. give any guidelines as to when we can start submitting? No, we haven't gotten this side of for guidelines mm -hmm. on submissions okay. yet. Okay. So we do, we have the dollar amount. We have kind of what we can spend it on, where, when we can spend it, but no information yet as so, to so the process. So, so to the extent that that um, somebody found themselves no longer employed by the district last, as of last April, um, in theory, those dollars could use to be used to rehire that, rehire person, that person if there was a need for a year, mm -hmm. and then if the funding didn't exist in the budget for a position that was cut, it would simply evaporate again. Correct. 
Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I That's why I think we should just, you know, put that money in the back pocket at this point and wait until the budget goes through and that process happens and make decisions. We have lots of time to make those decisions about what to do with that money. But that is there. Um, we had the, at Maple Lab this morning, the pump and the motor on the oil tank went. Um, so we had to replace the pump and motor. Um, it's about 20 years old. Unfortunately, I think all of our systems are like 20 to 25 years old and that seems to be the <coughs> oil tanks are tough this week. Um, we had the middle schools last week. Um, so they were able to keep it primed. It was still going because it had oil in the system. They were there first thing this morning fixing it. We never lost heat, so it didn't ever get to be like 40 degrees. It wasn't cold in the building, was it? Yeah. Do you have My gut is that people who were there probably wouldn't even have known it happened other than Honeywell being there. But we have replaced um, the, the, the pump has been replaced. I believe the motor is on order and will be replaced. What is the rough cost? Uh, under a thousand dollars. About about a thousand. Jerry estimated about eight hundred dollars okay. as an estimated quote for that. So <coughs> that's in the works. Um, we are knee deep in painting at the SAU office. Mm -hmm. um, we hope by Thursday they'll be done with the first floor. But I will tell you, if you haven't been to the SAU office, stop by. It looks beautiful. They've really done a nice job. They've really fixed up a lot of things. Um, it does make the carpet look really bad, I will tell you. Now that we have nice <laughs> clean walls, and uh, you know, this was a good opportunity for everybody to kind of clean out their office areas, and we got rid of a lot of stuff that was lying around. So it just really looks neat and clean and tidy, and now the carpets look really bad. But um, they did tell us if we rented a steam cleaner that they would steam clean the carpets for us, so that we may try to figure that one out before they leave. Oh, for um, the viewing public, um, the correctional facility the inmates have actually given all their time, time. to do this Three for us. We just had to buy the supplies, the such as the paint. Yeah. Um, that was that. So it's just a wonderful to, benefit to us. Just a reminder, we have the SAU board meeting tomorrow at 7. Um, parent surveys, I hope to have those for your next board meeting. They have been collated. They have been done. I just need to review them. A meeting with, I have a principal's meeting. Um, on the 14th and I want them to see it before the board sees it so um, we'll be reviewing that on the 14th we had a thousand twenty five responses um, so you can imagine what that was like to hand calculate the hundred and so questions that were for on there um, for Denise had I think on Friday she handed them to me I'm done and I was like oh <laughs> it was a lot of work it was a lot of effort but hopefully it, um, I, th I think it tells a good story so um, I'll have I'll hopefully have those for us at the next board meeting. I just I wanted to share with the principals before I bought it to the public. Um, I did get information today on the delegate assembly for the school boards association, and so I am looking for somebody who wants to volunteer to go to that as representing the school board. It's January fifteenth. From hot topics are from nine to noon, lunches noon to one, and then the delegate assembly is one fifteen to three thirty. And actually, at the last meeting or the one before, Philip had. Uh agreed to go on behalf of the board if possible <coughs> right if he says I said that I can't deny it I guess I, I, what I said to you is I said, would you like yeah. are you gonna be willing to <laughs> go this so year yeah, and you nodded yes I guess yeah. so yep. 15th work for you what what time are the parents 9, 9 to three thirty. all right I, I will be happy to go I will need to leave it about 2 30 okay so if anybody has um, Actually, that, that came to me as well, but it hasn't gone to the entire board. Um, is it something that we can scan and send out electronically? Yeah, what I'll do is um, for the board, it, I will... It'd be nice for everyone to get a copy of... I think it does uh, go to everybody. Did it go to everybody? I, I, I know I got one. it goes one. to the, all the school board members. Did, ever, did anybody get the delegate package where it actually talks about um, the uh, amendments and resolutions that are coming forward? I didn't think so. Okay. Usually it sends it to I'll the, scan it in. <laughs> what I've done in the past is kind of taken some notes on there just indicating kind of what my thoughts are on those proposals so that the board has an idea. I'll do that and send them out to everybody. And the people that get paper copies will get paper copies. There's a couple people that don't have electronically sent to them. Yep. That'd be great, thank you. Um, the, we did get the arbitration decision back on the grievance for Mountain View Middle School and the arbitrator did find in favor of the GEA. Um, if you recall, that was the grievance on walking students in in the morning and walking them to and from lunch. Um, and so we have gone back to the practice that just all the kids come in the building without supervision. So we'll see how that works. But um, that was that. 
can I get a copy of the arbitrator's decision? Yeah. Anybody else? If anybody wants one, why don't you send me an email? I can absolutely send it to you. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll hold that on the Just and the last one. Um, if any, just as an update for the elementary facilities committee, we're meeting on Friday with the. Um, how many did we end up getting? Ten. Ten. Ten vendors who are interested in submitting bids and proposals for the elementary school project. So we'll be meeting with them on Friday to do um, on-site visits. We thought that was a good day because kids weren't in the building. They would have some opportunities to get through the building. Um, and so the committee and the ten vendors plus whoever they bring with them will be taking them on a tour starting at Bartlett and then going to Maple Ave. So um, that will be a full afternoon for them. But um, we'll keep you updated just to update where we are in the process. Excellent. Thank you. And that's all I have. Okay, old business policy E C A F audio and video surveillance on yes. school buses. This is our second reading again. Second read again. Mm -hmm. Again, this is just the little um, piece that was added in about uh, the school board being able to see it um, only um, for disciplinary or expulsion hearing evidence, and um, the piece about the maintenance department. You might need to review just to check for maintenance. So those are just the little tweaks that were put in it. And does anybody have any further comment? Seeing none, I'd accept a motion to approve or not approve. So move. To approve? Mm -hmm. Do second. I have a second to approve it? Lori? Any discussion? I think we have talked about it quite a bit at previous meetings. Mm -hmm. All right, all in favor of approving it? That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, development of the third draft of the 2011 Warren Articles. We did some corrections on it, added some dates into it, and I know we reworded one of them. Is it Article Three? Yeah, Article Three. Yeah, Article Three. No. No, I don't think we reworded any of them. I think there was reference to Article Seven, which doesn't appear to be there anymore. That's what it was. We were considering another article. That's. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it? What was that? The facilities changed the purpose. What's there? Mm -hmm. There was discussion regarding whether or not we should keep Article 4 in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep, I think Article 3. Oh, no, it is Article 4. Mm -hmm. 3, 5, and 6 were kind of the conversation pieces about whether we should keep them in or not. And we actually are, are not at the point where we have to, we're not at our deadline yet for that. Yep. So, but if anybody has any <coughs> additional information they didn't share last time? Jennifer? I have a question about Article 6. Um, currently it says the school board voted 700. We did? Oh, that was a lot. That's from that last, was from year. last year. <laughs> that, was, that was on the ballot last okay. year. <laughs> Just checking. Yeah. Um, I think the wording on Article 4 is um, confusing to anyone who, who doesn't really understand what that article is. Yeah, we'd have to, that's the legal language we have to use. Okay. It's based on the RSA. And could that be explained further to say that um, mm -hmm. what we're looking for is if... Yeah. It, could be explained, it could be explained like in our voter's guide when we send that out. Okay. Um, but it can't be, but it can't be on, the on the ballot. ballot. That's why you'll see that's in quotation marks because that's what we have to put in because of the RSA. Usually if you see uh, quotation marks in an article, it's because it's required by RSA to word it that way. Correct? I Correct. Yeah. yeah. It's written right in there. This is how you, what the language is. Because you'll see that in the budget one as well. We have to use specific wording. And I think Sue Tremblay talked about that one at the last meeting, just the... To not include, to not include it, yeah. Um, and then you added Article 7, which doesn't appear to be there. What, what, is, what was Article oh, 7? I don't know, but the minutes say um, Stacy Buckley read aloud Article 4 and reviewed new Article 7. Um, I'll have to go back because I don't know that. Mm -hmm. what is that <laughs> Maybe oh. that's a typo. I, think it I wonder be. if maybe Article 6 was listed as Article 7, maybe when it carried over. I don't think we talked about any other <coughs> articles there on there. No. Okay, oh, let me All just right. double, we'll check double check for the next meeting, though. What are the articles? 
you'll see draft number four potentially on the next board meeting. Okay. Is it too late to amend the meeting minutes then? <laughs> yes, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, any other comments or any, any new information you want to share? None. Revenues. <clears throat> so this is again, um, probably by the next meeting we'll need to determine what we, the conversation we had at the last meeting was just how much we are expecting in the unreserved fund balance as well as what we would put in the warrant articles for the reserved balance. Um, and so the conversation ensued about how much we should put in there. And for us, it's an educated guess in the sense of we've not had such a tight budget before. Um, so knowing what we will land with. Um, so I, I suspect, I mean, we could hold off, I guess, looking for more information on whether the warrant articles are going to go forward will make a difference on what we put in the unreserved fund balance. Um, if we fund the $300,000 for the Bartlett facility, I would suggest we put about $100,000. We anticipate between probably one hundred and $200,000, only with such a big budget you're going to get down to where yeah, you can't spend down to zero because you don't, you're always going to have bills coming and going, so it makes it a little harder. Um, but we don't anticipate having a million dollars at the end of this project um, year. So um, we're anticipating somewhere, if you funded that Warren article, having less to put in the unreserved fund balance. So if you funded the 300, we may have 50 or 100 thousand dollars left. If you didn't fund it, I would say probably a two or three hundred thousand dollars would be. Uh, an estimated number given, I, I, I would hate to see it go down to zero and us get bills in afterwards that we can't pay. So we always have to play that piece out. Um, so that's just kind of our educated guess at this point in time. So, so if you had to make a recommendation um, for placeholders, because really, given that we don't know, they can be described in no other way. Right. What would you recommend for placeholders? I, I would say if, if we had to guess, say three or four hundred thousand dollars at the end of the game, at the at that bottom line. So if three if three hundred were going to the unreserved fund balance, I'd say put a hundred thousand in. I mean, if three hundred were going to go to the um, capital reserve capital fund. reserve fund, put a hundred thousand in the unreserved fund balance. Is, is is there is there any reason that we can't make that decision today? And is there and if there is, is there any value to waiting until? No, the, the only piece would be knowing. I mean, it's it's wherever it's it's the placement of it. If you decided not to fund the capital reserve project, I would say put three or four hundred in the unreserved fund balance line. So it just depends I, on where you want to okay. put it. It would end up there, there anyway, anyway if it, if the uh, article to deposit into the capital reserve is not approved, then that money would shift to the unreserved fund, fund balance. balance. Well, let's, let's, um, I would, I would support the article again is for 300, up, up to 300. Up to. Correct. Um, for, even though there's no motion. Um, yeah, it's a little premature for us to make motions right. at this time. Yeah, but we but, can, we can put I, three and one in, think, so I, you can look at the numbers and well, see Well, I think that makes sense that. from a practical standpoint, because I think if there was something left, we know we have an expense on the horizon, mm -hmm. and if we can use that capital reserve fund, that's a judicious use of those dollars. Yep. Okay. And it, it simply means that we don't have to raise them at a later date. Yes. yes. You know, and therefore, um, it reduces the amount of interest that we might have to pay in any bonding that we might have to do. Yep. So to the extent that we needed to portion that out, I would portion as much to the uh, capital reserve, reserve as we could. Mm -hmm. Okay. We will do that then and bring that back to the next meeting. Good. Thank you. Thank you. New business, Mountain View Middle School field trip request. Yep, I have a request from Team 83 to go to the Boston Freedom Trail. It's a repeat field trip, but it's out of state, so. So if there's no motion, it's on the medically approved. Any motion? Excellent. We can jump right onto the United Nations field trip. Yep, um, I have a request from Eric Romain. Um, again, this is a repeat. They did it last year um, to take a one-day field trip to the United Nations with 105 of his seniors. Um, <coughs> they're students in the Great Decisions um, World Studies course he teaches. They're going to do a tour of the United the, the United Nations building. They're looking to leave at. It's going to do it on April 1st. Looking to leave at 5 a.m. and return around midnight. Um, 
do they normally have adult chaperones, other parents going with them to help out with they it? They do. Or? They have I a couple. So. Okay. Um, it's certainly less than what we have at the elementary because oh, it's yeah. juniors and seniors, mostly seniors, so they're fairly responsible kids. You know, but um, yes, they do. I think several teachers go. Okay. Um, if there's no motion, it's automatically be approved. Any motion? All righty. We can move on to a first read of policy JKAA. Yes. This is the use of restraints. New policy. The majority of this is straight out of statute. Um, I think really page two is the only portion that we actually had to write, and that's because we had to determine our circumstances in which restraints may be used. But otherwise than that, really, there's not much else we could change. Cause that's the way it is. Okay. Just know for the first meeting in January, it'll come up for a second read and the possibility for a motion to approve. Sixth grade recess versus instructional time. So this is a conversation I just want to bring before the board so that you're aware of kind of the situation and what we're proposing or looking to do so because it's likely going to come up <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that you know um, what has happened as we've gone on to our new reading program which we're asking looking at a 90 minute block so we're looking at a solid 90 minute block for math and a solid 90 minute block for language arts what we have found is in the sixth grade um, at Mountain View the last kind of block of the day is only 75 minutes long and so depending on what teacher you have and depending on what class you have it's cutting into some of that instructional time particularly for language arts and math um, science and social studies the teachers are kind of managing that piece of it but for math and language arts they're getting 75 minutes of instruction versus 90 minutes of instruction which doesn't seem like a lot but 15 minutes over a week is an hour and a half over a year it's a pretty significant amount of time where lacking on that instruction. So um, Jim has met with Ginny and they have met with each team to talk about options and to try to come to what can we do in the best interest of kids and so they're recommending that we um, not eliminate recess but reduce recess for sixth grade. And so what we would be looking to do is they have lunch from 12.30 um, to 12.52 and then they have recess from 12.52 to 1.12. Um, what they do is they have lunch and they all stay inside and then at recess they go out for recess. What we're looking to do is as kids finish up, allow them to go outside um, so that it's not at the 12.52 they have to go out, but they can go out when they fi as they finish up and let <coughs> them stay out with the, with the hope that they would be back in class in instruction at one o'clock. So we would gain 12 minutes of instruction at that point in time. So kids would get between 10 and 12 minutes of recess time, um, depending on if they were first in line, quicker readers, slower readers, mm -hmm. but they would still get about 10 minutes of recess time. Um, it's, a, it's a struggle, it's a balance, trying to figure out that instructional piece, um, but teachers have been really clear that they're missing that 15 minutes. We've had a couple of parents say, hey, wait a second, my kids got re language arts during that period of time and they're only getting 75 minutes of instructional time. Um, and so we're trying to balance that and address it um, in both areas. So um, it is a conversation. So I guess I'm, I'm looking for feedback or input from the board um, because it's part of the instructional day. The board doesn't have to approve it, but I would like your input if anybody has concerns or questions. So how about the other classes? Are they not getting 90 minutes? And they're yeah, they do. It, just, it happens that the way the period is broken up um, and every schedule is different, but if you look at the, the way sixth grade is broken up with the, only fifth and sixth grade have recess. Um, and then with the ECB time isn't smash in the middle. So like they have lunch recess, they have a 30 minute time, the team time, band time, and then they have the rest of that period for 45 minutes. So all the other class periods are 75 minutes long or 90 minutes that one block period is only 75. So why can't we change like the ECB a bit? Is ECB after the recess? It, it's lunch, recess, the ELA time, so they have, they have 30 minutes, and then they have the team time band, and then they have language arts continuing, or whatever, depending on the, the class. So some kids have language arts, some kids have math. Um, the, the problem with that is it's an instructional period that band and chorus go into, so you'll lose 
all those kids. I think that's when that we do foreign language as well. I think, no, Mary, is that not when you do foreign language? So, um, so that's our recommendation is to shorten up recess, not remove it, but shorten it up. Jennifer? My question was how long <coughs> of a recess is it to begin with? It's 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And so you're thinking of cutting it down to 10, 10 effectively. Yeah. 10 to 12, depending on how, if kids go in and eat lunch and get done, they can now go outside. They'd be able to go outside as soon as they were done versus right now they wait till everybody, till that, that period of time ends and go out. And that would be different than what happens for 7th and 8th grade because I think it's more conditional for 7th and 8th grade if they get to finish up their lunch. Right, they don't have an extended time. There's this 22 minutes of lunch whatever time they finish up, they wouldn't have that extra period. So we're kind of adding on that eight or 10 minutes of time. It's a tough decision, but I, I mean, um, I look at it like it's academics. Yes. It's instructional. Uh, I, um, I guess my concern is how are we handling um, supervision in the fact that you're letting them come out of lunch out of the cafeteria outside. So now the people that normally were in the cafeteria could go outside yep. and cover recess are gonna be Yep, we divided. Would, yeah, we would divvy them up depending on how many were out there. You know, kind of like what we do seventh and eighth grade is we already do that. So, okay. On nice days, I guess my thought is, um, to a degree, recess serves a purpose, uh, and you know, clearly, it's determined when you hit seventh grade. Perhaps you don't need recess, or we don't do that, but we do at sixth. But if they've got a lot of energy to burn off. I'm not sure how valuable that instructional time then is. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I definitely see that we have a situation, and maybe that doesn't exist in sixth grade, but I know in the younger grades it certainly does. Like, <laughs> you've <laughs> got to burn off some energy oh, absolutely. before you can bring your brain to, to the front and, and do what you have to do. And I just think it's, it's a fine line. I, I personally, I'd like to see them have more than 10 minutes, but I also recognize that we need to be focusing on, on academics and, in general. Uh, schools need to. Um, there's no other way. There's no other time in the day. I mean, it, the day is the day. And, and this is as a result of reading streets during a 90. I mean, this this is new. This it's a new conflict because of our new program. Well, because I think the expectation is that they're doing reading streets for 90 minutes. We're holding teachers firm to that. We'd like to see 90 minutes of instructional time for reading and for math. That's part of our CINE plans. That's part of our DINI plans. That's what the, I mean, Reading Streets call, actually Reading Streets would like to see two hours of time versus 90 minutes, but given our, our schedule, there's only so many minutes in a day. Mm -hmm. Um I, I would have a concern that the students <coughs> that are at the end of the line may have no recess or no time to. Well, they would still have at least that eight to 10 minutes that goes beyond regardless. lunch period, regardless. regardless. So they would still have that time period of when lunch ended and when they actually have that recess time. Any other feedback? There's no um, motion needed, but yeah, we do I'm need still to write our feedback. Of how fifth grade can do it, but six can't. Yeah, I only bought sixth grade a pack. Because it, it seems like if if there's that means it could be how they're I'm guessing it's how their schedule may be. I, I honestly can't answer the question. Each I sixth grade team has a, stiff, a different rotating schedule, a different schedule based on when they go oh, to specials, when they go to foreign language, those kinds of things. This particular team, the way their schedule is set up, gives them a 75 minute period at the end of the day that other teams be 60 minute period at the end of the day for a different sixth grade team, for example. So this team is missing those few minutes because they are, s they are frozen periods like UA, lunch, foreign language, yeah. their frozen periods during the day um, don't affect a 90 minute time period. Where this particular team, it affects the 90 minute time period. So that's why it's only one of the three, six, three, right? Three, six, yeah, three thank you, Mary. So does that mean they have more time somewhere else earlier in the day since it's less time Later, the, the, the academic. I mean, yeah. I don't mean to. Yeah, no, that's okay. The academic time yeah. is. We all start classes at quarter and nine, and we all end at three ten. So, and we all have a forty-five minute specials period. We all have a twenty-two minute lunch. Well, they have the recess yep. too. So, I mean, technically, yes, all the teams have the same amount of academic minutes. 
in the in the day. It's just how those how minutes fall. Yeah. So remember too, if you have a two person team is gonna be different than a three person team. For example, like I'm looking at team one, one teacher teaches ELA. So that's where that ELA period, so she's, so it may be broken up different for a two person team because that teacher's teaching two subject areas so it's easier to play around with the schedule. With a three person team or a four person team, it's more content focused. So one teacher may be teaching two or three English language arts class and somebody else may be doing math. It's a confusing yeah. schedule. Yeah, it's yeah. it's very difficult to, it's to an grasp. Artifact. It's an it artifact is. of the structure and the number yeah. of teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah. So are they looking to cut lunch for just one team? No, they're looking to do universal for sixth grade because I don't think it would be fair to say yeah, some yeah, kids are going to go out and some kids same, aren't. Right, they all have lunch at the same yeah, time. Yeah. So you'd have to cut it for the So really what we're looking grade. to do is reduce, in, in good terms, reduce recess from 20 minutes to like 10 minutes. I think it's like 8 minutes or to 8 to 10 minutes. So then for the other teams, they end up with more than 90 minutes at the end somewhere? Right, they would come back. They yeah, would come back at the same time. Earlier than they normally would. So yes, they would be... Yep. What is you saying? 15 minutes. There would be extra 15 minutes yeah. of academic time for the other two teams. Is this something that can be addressed at all? I mean, in the wildest scenarios, rearranging the entire schedule is that? I'm not thinking this year, but I'm thinking next yeah. year. It's it's <coughs> tough. I th I think there's um, there's a committee that's looking at scheduling, and because I think one of the big questions has been that ECB team time kind of period, what to do with it. So if I know there's a group of teachers who are meeting through the um, uh, faculty <coughs> focus group that are looking at kind of this. So there may be a solution, a different solution for next year. Um, we're just stuck in this gap of period of time where it's like, wait a second, these kids are not getting an hour and a half a week or an hour and 15 minutes a week of reading or of math during that instructional period of time. And so I think the teachers are feeling it going, well, how are we going to get through, you know, when everybody's kind of pacing out reading streets as they're learning it and this team is falling behind because they don't have 90 minutes of language arts where the morning, whoever's teaching it in the morning has that 90 minutes. So this class is always 15 minutes behind. And 15 minutes is a little, I think. It's, it's a long time. It's Peggy 40, could say 15 minutes a of reading streets is a lot of time. It's a, that's gigantic. <laughs> yeah. So it's not to hurt the, I mean, obviously, we, if we could find another solution, right. we would. Mm -hmm. There just isn't, there isn't enough time in the day for this right. group of kids. And so we're trying to be flexible, not taking recess away, but trying to alter it a tad bit so they still have some time to go outside, but that we can still connect to the instructional with the goal that I think the, this group is going to look at and say what is in the best interest of kids as we go forward. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying this, you know, this may be this year and... I don't know. We, the, the positive side is we've had lots of parents complaining that their kid's not getting the instructional piece. And that's kind of what prompted this whole thing was parents saying, wait a second, sixth grade, my kid's not getting the 90 minutes of math or 90 minutes of language arts that they should be getting. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to relate to that mm -hmm. kind of concern and address that, but still give kids some recess well, time. Can, can, can we sort of get a, as, as we go through this, once it's implemented, can we get a report out, see how it's working, see how it's working for the kids, see if there are any observable changes? Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because um, 90 minutes is a long period um, if you aren't really able to um, shut off, turn back on again. Yeah. You know, that's a, well, you know, 90 minutes is, if you're not there, Yep. And it's, Reading it's Street's the plus of it. I mean, yeah. it's very interactive. It changes quite frequently. I mean, so it's not 90 minutes of doing just reading. Yeah. It's, I've, you know. I've never seen a 90 minute yeah. class where Fannies are in the seats the entire class. Yeah. It yes, simply I, doesn't happen. I realize that. I know. But, <laughs> but Somebody but would go screaming from the room. <laughs> I think, I think my fear is, though, <laughs> what you gain in cutting off for recess time, you lose in, in instructional time because they just can't pull it together. Right. That I mean, that's that's what we need to find out. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, it's it's not that this is perfect. And you probably can't fit 15 minutes of of reading streets somewhere else in the day. Uh, is it is it that mobile of a product where it can fit in that team's extra well, 15 minutes of the I structure? Mean, think, yeah, yeah. Unless you can figure out a way to, to to back it up, and I guess that's something that we we kind of figure out in real time, but. Um, to the extent that you already have dedicated blocks to dedicated things, right. trying to squeeze something that 
that's a discontinuity into a span of time simply because you have that may not in the long run create the benefit that adding the 15 minutes to a continuous time frame gives you so I guess too another concern is it's one team yeah it's not it's not the grade so but it will continue to be that team forever and ever and ever like that's unless something drastically changes with the schedule that team will always have this so every sixth grade class coming through will always have I don't want to say the problem team, <laughs> but the, the team that doesn't have enough time in that block of period. Yeah. Um, and if we, uh, you know, it's that that schedule is a is a nightmare to look at and to think about because it's HQT. It's t so we, I, I get what you're saying. Is there 15 minutes somewhere else? And so like uh, science and social studies could be 60 minutes as opposed to 75 or 90, but it's probably likely that that block is at a time period that the teacher who's teaching English language arts isn't available. You know, it's uh, not enough mixes yeah. to the mold. <laughs> yeah, so where is that um, sixth grade team getting their extra minutes right now? That they're not getting that extra 15 minutes where everybody else has it, language arts and math. They still have the same instructional time, so they have to have that 15 minutes somewhere. So what are they getting extra? Well, it's, see, it's not something extra. It's the subject content of who's teaching what when they're teaching it and how many people are on each team so a two-person team who teaches two subject areas can schedule social studies or science say in the afternoon and language arts and math when they have the two 90 minute block say in the morning when you're on a three or four person team you have that same person who's maybe teaching the same content area so you can't align it that way because somebody's got to have class in the afternoon does that make sense it, it's a it's a huge puzzle to put together depending so that on 15 minutes is just being absorbed by some of the other subject matters right and right I'm where what subject yeah, right. are they getting more time in so they may be getting 90 minutes of science versus language arts I'm just guess I'm just putting that out there as an assumption no, you know um, so they may be getting 90 minutes of science you're, just, you're moving around the blocks well, right I, I'm, just, I'm just saying if they're falling behind in reading because they're losing the extra 15 minutes, does that mean they're gaining somewhere else in a different subject because they would have 15 minutes more than the other two teams? Right, it could be science or social studies or math. It depends on yeah. where that falls in their schedule. In the ideal world, we'd have a teacher teaching everything, language arts in the morning <laughs> after that so that we'd have that period of time. But I, th I think they are exploring <laughs> some other opportunities or some other options, so we may have another solution next year, but mm -hmm. this was what we could come up with this year to to try to address the situation. When was the last time we overhauled the structure of our classes? Was it three years ago for sixth grade, or the last time well, they really made some significant we, changes we made to some, the time? I think the biggest shift we did was moving team time to the end of the day. I think it used to be at some point like spread throughout. We moved it to the end of the day for sports and athletics. So if kids were leaving, it was that. Mm -hmm. That all band of music was pulled out at the same time. But it may be time to rethink that entire structure and maybe team time doesn't work anymore maybe that should be all instructional focused time and we realign how we do band and core you know i don't i don't know there's there's a lot on the table to think about when you when you start getting into that what's you know you don't want to block music and chorus because those are great things but is there other periods that work better is there a different way to do it uh, do you remember the last time we did significant overhauls to it I, don't, I mean, it might have been before your time. So. Yeah, I, I mean, the last overhaul I think we did with this was moving the team time ECB periods to yeah, the end I of the day, which was probably a couple years ago. Yeah, okay. um, I mean, I think we always tweak it and try to try to think differently about it, but. Um. Well, to some degree, it's sounding like there's not enough time in, in a day. There isn't. And, um, you know, obviously <coughs> instruction is imperative. It's, it's so important, and yet you look at it, this generation being the first in how long that's life expectancy is lower than its parents because yeah. of childhood obesity rates. I and mean, we look at recognizing the importance of an active lifestyle, not to mention just the academic need of burning off yeah. of some energy. And, and I do think physical activity to a degree is, is likewise a priority. Is it a higher priority than academics? No, but it's right up there. Where Absolutely. Oh, oh Absolutely. And fifth and sixth um, grade just meets the minimum requirements of 990 hours. Yeah. We just meet it. Yeah, we exceeded for seventh and eighth grade. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and the elementary's and the high school. It's fifth and sixth grade because of the 
recess period of time. We just make 990 minutes. Any other feedback? All right. We're appreciate gonna the feedback. And, and <laughs> I was say, I just appreciate the feedback. And, you know, maybe in January we'll come back with kind of how it's working, what's working. But I, I wanted you to know so in case parents or somebody called you and said, what the heck is this change? You're now kind of somewhat knowledgeable about why that was. All righty. Um, next one, discussion of budget presentation to budget committee. Um, we did our presentation on Saturday the 13th. Quite a few of you were in attendance. Uh, so you'll know that I did make a commitment that I would come back to the board and open up discussion if any board members had any suggestions for modifications to our budgets or reductions. Um, I made a commitment that I'd come back and ask that question. So I'm now asking that question. It's not our last chance to make revisions, but do we have any, after we've reviewed it some more, has anybody come back with any other suggestions on the budget? I don't have a suggestion, but I do have a question. Because after seeing what the default would be and how based on, I think the bonding had a, we had a huge decrease. Right. But um, what do we kind of replace that money with in the budget? Because we still, we still went up. So there, there must have been something else we've Contractual added. Contractual obligations for salary and benefits, I think, would probably absorb well, most we, of it. Well, we, breaking it up, you were able to see, you know, what the contractual obligations were, salary benefits, and how much that went up. But it was kind of the difference off of that that I, I couldn't really get a handle on of the other things that kind of uh, made that difference between <coughs> the default budget said our yep. contractual obligations would do and what our I, I think budget. probably the biggest, instead of thinking about where we increased, I think the default decreased because of the bond, but also for special ed yes. because we cut back on the added district tuition. So I don't know that the budget increased that much versus the default decreased. Yeah, because we did take those kids yeah. back because in district. Because we took the elements that go into the default. If you remember increase, last year, yeah. we gave back a lot of the money. Like I think it was like six hundred thousand was in special ed out of district tuition. So we cut that line way back uh, because of the programs we've developed. We've been able to keep more kids in. So I think it was a, a function of those things going down that lowered the default. Does that make sense? Uh, a little bit. Like if you look at the spreadsheet, if you look at the sheet for the default and you go through those, the lines that identify where the increases or decreases were, that's where you'll see those huge swings in, in at least yeah, in special ed. Yeah, and I noticed that. So yeah. I guess I was more confused of where the, what, what made up that difference between the default and our budget, not considering the, like the additions of the, um, the extra personnel that we're going to get re and reimbursed mm -hmm. for and other things like that. But taking that out, what did we really increase? I think it was like half a million. That kind of was. Oh, the differential increased yeah, by half a million. Uh, of like what? What was the, you know, what was the big chunk that would have made that? Probably the six hundred thousand dollars special ed that was out of district in last year's budget, but because that we was brought back, back in, in. Yeah, we gave it back in our own reserve fund balance, and this year we can't budget for that, so the default budget has to go down by that amount. But we're budgeting because are we expecting to put out a district again, or? I mean, no. we have at some out. We have kids well, that are out we, of the district. Yes, yeah. I, know we definitely I don't have think we're some. expecting any major increases in it at this point. But you never know who will move into the community or move out. Um, and I think the part of the gap might have increased too, just because of the significant increases we have contractually as well. Yeah. And I, th um, I mean, I'm trying to think of what line. I, like we have the 120,000 for high school for the curriculum revision for ELA for mm -hmm. that. That was an increase. Um, I have to go through and look line by line, but I mean, there's that was the, that's the big one that I think of that stands out like as a bigger yeah. item, you know. Health insurance, health yeah. insurance, health and dental. Yeah. Oh, and then the increase of what we have to pay towards retirement and everything as well. Yep, yeah, that's that whole benefit, you yeah. know, the salary and benefit line. Does that cal get calculated in the default? Yep. We're contractually obligated to pay it because of contracts and the yep. state changes their rates. They <laughs> change their rates and everybody just has to follow suit and enjoy it. Anybody have any other questions, comments, suggestions? If, if you're templating scenarios, 
consider streamlining your service delivery if if there's any way possible to cluster like learners well they do I, I know in special ed they do that we try to put kids who need reading instruction pull out in the same class so that we can pull them out um, it's not always possible because we have to like to balance classes and not put all the identified kids in one class and not in all of them but we try to do that as often as possible I guess it's, it's got to be a pretty fine balance. I mean, I think we probably do a little more streamlining now than we did four or five years ago. Um, not just necessarily at the elementary level, but for example, at the high school, we created the True Honors Program. Um, so we probably do it a little bit. I know Bartlett does it with their, with their math and reading uh, to some degree. Um, I think the streamlining, I'm not sure it would save any money. It might help benefit some of the educational process, but I, I don't see where it would necessarily save us any money because I don't think we could reduce staff or anything. You don't think you could reduce staff by focusing the laser a little tighter on, on the group that needs those particular services? Um, you yeah, know, instead, you of, instead of having a teacher that, you know, ran all around the school trying to find her students, you know, and maybe this, I don't, I know I don't understand how the schedule works. It's huge, and yeah. I know that. Yeah, well, like like at the elementary level, we have, I mean, teachers don't cover multiple grade levels. Oftentimes, we have, like, at Maple Lab, we have a special ed teacher who covers first and second grade, and we have a teacher who covers third grade, and a teacher who covers fourth grade. For um, special ed. For special ed. You know, at Mountain View, at the middle school, we have a teacher connected to different, te to a team. Um, so they're not, you wouldn't necessarily see a special ed teacher in, fifth grade working with fifth grade and eighth grade. Um, you may if there's a schedule need, but for the most part, um, they're tied to a grade level or a team um, with a para and that's what they do. I mean, we try to, again, we try to look and say, okay, for, now one of the things we did differently this year was with, I think, the math and setting up like learning labs where teachers are, and that's kind of that focused piece where Everybody in fifth grade who's at this level who needs math instruction comes at this point in time. So we do think outside of the box on a lot of this, but it's complicated. It's, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not something that you can just say, okay, we're going to pull all the sixth graders because maybe Johnny and Mary, you can't put in the same group because maybe their learning styles are different and or maybe they're at different level. I mean, it's a, it's a complex process working yeah. with those level I, kids. I, I, I just can't envision being fair to saving money with that. I, I, it may help create a better process for learning, but... Um, we are, and we do it, and, and to some degree, you, you, you want you don't want to be completely homogeneous versus heterogeneous. Um, so no, I, th I no, think we've actually taken balance. the mix. We made it a little bit more homogeneous than heter uh, heterogeneous over the last few years. Well, the honors program was certainly one. Um, yeah. Yes. You know the algebra classes. Yep. At, over algebra at, one. And um, so, you know, I, I think we've we've developed a little bit more of that. Um, so I, I'd say we've probably taken some steps that way. Which might, in a way, also complicate things, because mm -hmm. now you've got... Oh, I'm sure it does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the algebra classes definitely complicate the middle school. <coughs> yeah. But don't take them away. <laughs> yeah. um, I just have a thought, and it's, it's not something that I think is a wise thing to do, but in that our default is so low this year, um, I was just thinking that if we took out all of the repairs, improvements, like carpeting and stuff, I, kn I know it will only come back, being <coughs> having been on this board for a long time, <coughs> that it only comes back to bite you when you pay more for it later. But um, if we were to take those kinds of things out, and if the budget committee, um, would meet us halfway with a recommendation if we took those kinds of monies out and they would say, okay, that's good enough. Um, we will recommend the budget that, that comes out of that deduction. I would be in favor of that. I, like I said, I don't think it's a smart thing to do. I think that the taxpayers will probably pay more, you know, when we have to do it later on. but. It's just something I'm going to throw out there. If we could get the cooperation of the budget committee instead of, you know, being hard and fast about 10 percent, but if they would listen, listen and hear um, 
to what our budget is and, and um, understand it a little bit better and come to a working compromise with us, that would be something that I would. I think the working compromise has been very difficult so budget committee the last couple of years. Support. I know it has, and that's why I'm saying this. I would not support that if they wouldn't come back and recommend that budget number as well. How much money are we talking roughly, Ray? There's not a um, significant amount of money I'm in thinking there you're for, talking about 100,000 and change maybe? If that, yeah. yeah. If that. So we're talking about a hundred thousand, probably. We've for already <coughs> deferred a large number of those uh, uh, projects that were on CIP. Yeah. The board made the decision to push, push those out an additional year, and that's where the significant dollars would be. <coughs> yeah, okay. I think we're talking. There's really eight. nothing there. Yeah. There's I mean, probably a hundred between. I would say there's probably between a hundred and two hundred. Uh, I'm range. not sure there's even 200. I'm thinking yeah, well, the biggest one is the about, library here yeah. for the rug here. I would say 200 if you think about all the littler things like refinishing the floors and yeah. replacing doors. I think there's yeah, some of those issues, issues are, are the you know, doors really have to be done. Effort between the two of us, I'd be willing to do that. Like I said, I don't think it's a smart thing to do, but if it would cre create a spirit of cooperation, um, I would hmm. go with it. Well, what I can say is they're, they're in deliberation mode now, mm -hmm. which means there's no public comment that can be made to them. So we can't appear at a board and all we can do is present them with an, another proposal or an updated budget. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we, 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 we're not in a position where we can sit down and negotiate with them at this yeah. point. Um, so that would be my concern that if we came back with a revised budget, say taking out that $100,000 that they would they simply do hear us on TV though so that they could <laughs> no absolutely absolutely yeah. the information would be there it will be in our minutes and we, we can highlight that for them so that anyway. it's in our minutes and if you and would be kind enough to review it um, I, I'm not sure that would necessarily <coughs> appease mm. the budget committee in whole mm. in fairness um, I think to look at the picture in its entirety, and if we look at something as like maintenance, mm -hmm. which is um, interestingly enough a remarkably easy target, um, because the connection it always is the connection between <coughs> a rug and student learning is a little difficult to see. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to frame that and to understand what it means, we need to take a look at the last three years and the things that we haven't done. We need to take a look at some of the ways that NEASNC measures us. We need to take a look at the history of this particular institution and now the middle school because it's also under the auspices of that review process. Um, one of the things that we have enormous problems with and one of the things that we had to recover from was science labs. Mm -hmm. doing this. It wasn't just science labs. That was big, mm -hmm. but it wasn't just science labs. Um, there was also sort of the, the general overall condition of the school. Um, somebody help me out here. What, what was the number here? Was it 11 million? What? Oh, for the remodel, it was 11 million change, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would make the argument that there, that there could have been savings on that $11 million by investing earlier. Um, and, and we've already foregone things. Um, to put something on the table, which is as little in relative terms as it is, and I'm not talking in terms of amount, I'm talking in terms of the work that's being performed, ignores how much we've already not done and to continue that practice and then to go back in a future budget and say okay well <coughs> do you remember do you remember hi do you remember what we didn't do the last time okay now we need to do it and we told you that this was going to come um, and so this shouldn't come as a surprise 
my guess is, is that that puts us in a spiral again that doesn't take a year, it might not take two years, it might not take three more years, but the further we go and the more that we do to affect the maintenance of our buildings and our institutions, the closer we get to be finding ourselves in the unenviable position of not being able to get the dollars that we need, waiting for five years to do it again. And so I'm not saying you're preaching, do- You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> you're right, I'm preaching a little bit, but it's not without understanding and framing what we're talking about. And I'm not preaching doom and gloom, it's just that people need to understand, everybody needs to understand here at this table and anybody who might be listening, that there are unintended consequences to short-term decisions. And getting somebody to do something that they didn't have to do in the future, excuse me, didn't have to do today in the future is harder. Because then not only do you have project A that you didn't do, but you have project B that you need to do um, and project C that you want to do. And A, B, and C together is always much larger than just A. And so as we go forward, I think that to the extent that you're willing to talk about maintenance, you need to look individually at a line and at a project and make a decision based upon individual appropriations. So if there's something out there that you believe we can wait on, that we haven't already waited on, um, and that we can do in the future. Let's talk about that. Um, but my recollection is, is that as we went through the budget and as we've gone through the budget for the last three years, that there's not a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be done <coughs> and that won't cost more in the future and that those lines won't be greater in the future because of things that we've foregone. You know, you, you remember that old commercial with the mechanic? You can pay me now or you can pay me later. It's not me, it's a, de it's a buying decision. You can do these things now or you can do them later. And when you aggregate them all up, they cost a lot more later. And by the way, they cost a lot more later merely because prices change. Um, if the need weren't there, we wouldn't be asking for the appropriation. <sighs> Personally, I call it penny wise, dollar foolish. That's a fair characterization. But, but the, my I, purpose I is, is, is not, is not <laughs> to convince or dissuade. It's simply to frame the entire picture. And so that as you consider doing something like that, if that is the will of this body, um, that we've at least talked about what it means. Diane? I guess I felt, because um, I think you are all at, at the meetings to, to work on the budget, and um, I really felt like we put together a good faith budget to start with. I, we all did a very good job of, of not asking for more. We have to consider keeping abreast of technological advances and, and the needs of the district there. We need to address keeping our buildings in, in some semblance of a working order. We really, my goodness, we had, we had somebody fairly apologetically asking for a bookshelf because she had it had been repaired so much it disintegrated. I mean, this was the spirit with which this budget wa was put forward. So I, I really do, I feel very strongly that we, we did a good faith low budget the first time around, and I'm inclined to maintain that. All right. Any other business, I should say, any other business that may legally become before the school board? I'm actually going to give it to Mary Grass. She had her hand up first. So. <laughs> <That's fine>. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that you've been discussing the budget because the, the, the I'll call it a proposal that I have to, to present to the board um, is budget related. Um, for those of you who are, are unaware, at both Mountain View and the middle school and the high school, um, we are required um, to give progress reports to students on a regular basis. Um, at the middle school, we've had a lot of discussions, the teachers, um, especially this year, but in the past, about the number of progress reports that we send home. 
Um, and I sat down this morning and did just a quick little math. This is just the eighth grade. We send nine progress reports home a school year. There are 100 students on my team. There are four teachers that send nine progress reports a school year to 100 students. That's 3,600 pieces of paper per team per year times three teams is almost 11,000 pieces of paper that we send home for just the eighth grade in progress reports. That's assuming that the progress report is one page. Some teams send home a one page progress report. Some teams send home multiple page progress reports because as we go further into the term, there are more assignments, they don't all fit on one piece of paper. Power School is a program in which parents have access to students' grades 24-7, okay? Um, parents can even have their students' their <coughs> child's grades emailed to them on a regular basis so that if they forget to go into Power School and look it up, they can get an email daily, weekly, monthly, whatever it is. What I would like to propose on behalf of the teachers at Mountain View and um, other teachers in the district is that we seriously consider a policy in which we no longer send home progress reports. 10, 11,000 sheets of paper for just the eighth grade. Multiply that by the seventh grade, the sixth grade, the fifth grade. The high school I know um, doesn't send home as many. They send home four sheets of paper per teacher, per, per student, at 1,200 students four times a year. So you're talking more like 4,800 pieces of paper, but it adds up. Um, my team alone, it's two cases of paper. And just my, my A3 team, it's two cases of paper. Power School is something that the district has invested money into. It's, it, we, we have a, a, a technology teacher here, a technology person here at the high school whose function primarily, at least from what I've been explained, is to maintain and, and monitor Power School. Um, the teachers have to go through training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think that it might not be, you know, a, a million dollar budget item, but over time, you're certainly talking a lot of paper, a lot of money that the district could save in addition to all the, the paper you save and, and the benefits to the environment and all those other things that you can bring up. Um, there are other districts, including the one that I live in, that no longer send home progress reports. My children have not received a paper progress report from their teachers in almost three years. My husband and I sign up to Par School, we get the, 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 the stuff sent to us and we monitor it that way. I know that not everybody in the district has access to the internet. I know not everyone has computers. Certainly, you could have students whose parents request a paper, power, a paper progress report sent home when progress reports are due out. Um, I, I think even that would greatly reduce the number of paper that we're using um, in, in the district, or at least at the middle school. Um, and so uh, um, I've discussed this with a lot of teachers in the building, trying to get feeling for is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? And I haven't found a teacher yet who doesn't think it's a great idea. Um, so I'm throwing it out to you for discussion, for review, for however you want to proceed with it. Um, and just say that this is something that we would like you to at least consider um, implementing at some point, if, if, if not this school year, which I understand that it could be tricky, but perhaps in the, the, the next school year, starting in September, um, we would like you to at least consider it. Thanks. For whatever it's worth, I haven't gotten a progress report on paper in three years, but well, <laughs> I may be the exception. But you get the well, that's the other well. issue. Yeah, yeah. at the middle school, in the, no, in the no, elementary, no, no, no. we I, still I get, get them. Yeah. I get them every week. Oh. So um. if, I, if I can follow up on that, um, because this did come up at the budget meeting, at uh, the budget discussion, and the board asked me to go investigate it, and so I certainly met with the principals. Um, for one is, I don't know that it would be a policy on how we send things home, but um, the board can certainly direct that way, but out of seven administrators, not one of them supported it. Um, they all supported paper because they felt that it gave more onus to the student when the student had that piece of paper with their grades on it, going home with them, and that they took the, some ownership to it versus just sending it home. But out of hmm. seven administrators, not one of them supported the concept. I don't think they were 
totally opposed to ever thinking about it again, but I didn't have one administrator say, yes, let's do that. So Well, I mean, I know the high school, the consider school that. Um, <laughs> passwords are, are shared, if not given to students. So right. their ownership is power school. That's at the high school. Um, I know in, in the middle school, at least with the students that I work with, I encourage them to go home and discuss with their parents the, the use of the password and to get on power school. And I, and I encourage them that that's where the information is. You, you need, you know, not, you need to use it. And to be honest with you, this is a technology age. I mean, those kids are texting, phoning, whatever. And so a piece of paper means nothing to students as, as the computer does. I mean, if I, if, I put a, if I put something on the computer and say we're gonna go to the computer lab and fill in this worksheet, I get twice as many enthusiastic responses as I do handing them the worksheet. <laughs> so I mean, maybe if you're gonna play into, into, into the ownership piece, students would own it and more. I know that parents, we spend a lot of time also chasing down the, the progress reports. Um, we sent home progress reports almost four weeks ago and we still have, in my team alone, we still have four parents we have yet to be able to verify received those progress reports four weeks ago. Um, we are playing phone tag with them, we're, we're, we're playing email tag, that kind of thing. Um, and um, perhaps by educating or re-educating the parents on the ability to get um, the information emailed to them um, on a basis, regular basis of their choosing, that would help to um, get parents um, to see it more often than it's stuffed in the bottom of the, the son's backpack and mom finds it when she's helping him clean it out a couple weeks later or something. I mean, I don't know. Uh, like I said, I, we were looking at it um, primarily from a, a, a cost saving uh, point of view and then the more the teachers discussed it, the more we felt that there was other benefits as well. So that's why I was willing to bring it up. I hate to throw out this dirty word, but could we survey parents? Not paper. <laughs> <laughs> Electronically? <laughs> Electronically. Is there some um, survey that could be mark, set up to survey the parents? Because um, I think that's really where you would get your best well, you, feedback. I, I suspect that because um, uh, to the extent that parents are getting information already, um, we probably have a survey, at least at some level. We absolutely probably I have some powerful <laughs> numbers which is, okay, how many parents are getting these things? Okay, I, I, and for me, I, I think a, yeah. a better question might be not should we do them by email, but is there, at, say at the middle and high school, is there a necessity to continue to do them? If we have logins and we have parents accessing PowerSchool, is there still a, is there still a need well, to I, do? I, guess the I think that's a better question to yeah, ask, I is agree. there still a need think, if parents can access it? I think my password is the same as updated. my child's password. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. Got one and, password. And, and, and therefore, you know, as no, you, I was listening to what you said about the problem of it being in the bottom I of think, Johnny's backpack. I think students actually have a separate password. They do. Oh, do they parents really? Do. Yeah. Okay. They oh. have their own passwords. Yeah, they have their oh. own passwords. Oh. At the middle school, they don't. No, I was going to say, at the middle school, I gave my daughter No, I think at the high school only. Really? Yeah. The middle school, they should have. I think we tried to do that because... That was what was happening was parents were giving the kids their password, which <coughs> I think gives you maybe <laughs> access to different things than the student has access to um, specifically, but yeah. there should be mm -hmm. two separate passwords. Hmm. You'd have to consider that I mean, for the middle school. Cause I, I think it is at the middle school level, they should be, be able to log on and start understanding what's yeah. being shared. I mean, especially in seventh and eighth grade, maybe fifth and sixth, maybe you could argue, and I don't work with them, so I don't really know, but maybe you could argue that they're a little too young. But I, we encourage our students at, in this, I was in the eighth grade, to go on power school all the time. I mean, students come to me, what's my grade? And I'll say to them, well, you haven't looked in power school? There's a computer right there, go look. And then if you have a question, I'll be more than willing to sit with you and discuss it. Um, you know, we'll print out a progress report. You don't need to print one out, it's right there online. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we really encourage, because we know when they come to the high school, that the high school's gonna do the same thing and encourage the same thing. You know. All right. So maybe give some consideration and maybe come back with some input on that later on. Stacey? I really, I really think too that even fifth and sixth graders could handle that. I remember this conversation from when we did switch over to Power School and we were considering the lunch login. How, how do you, how do you do the lunch login? Was it a card or a pin? And people were like, oh, first graders can't do pins. Well, they oh, can't. Oh, they've got it down they, they can't do it with their mittens on, but once they learn to take their mittens off, yes, they can. So. 
I, you know, I would suggest that you consider go as far down as fifth and sixth grade for individualized passwords. And it's um, it's interesting, and I, and I think I think if Mary um, hasn't already said this, if she did, I missed it, is that um, you see an evidence of changes in student behavior when they can go and check their grades every day. Yeah, it's very empowering. And, and but, it, but but that has nothing to do with progress reports. No, but, but, yeah. but it does have to do with readily available data that teachers are updating on a daily basis with new information. It certainly would show those teachers who don't update on a daily basis oh, or on a regular I, I basis. Most of them. <laughs> and, um, and we talked about that too. That, you know, the fact that it does put more pressure on the teachers to make yeah. sure that they get the stuff in in a timely manner. But I think. At least from the teachers I talked to, most people do anyway. So it, no one seemed to feel that oh, that was going to be a major issue. Um, but the other thing too is I, I think I think it helps to make a connection between the parent and the student. If a parent's getting an email on a regular basis about their child's progress in school <coughs> versus once every three or four weeks they get a, a piece of paper sent home, I, I think that that also helps to to open that communication more often about. Geez, you know what happened? I helped you study for that quiz, and I see you didn't do well on it. Because we all get busy, and you forget, you know, uh, 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 that you, you know your child <coughs> this activity or this thing to be do, to do in school or whatever. So I, I think, uh, and aside from that, would be that they, that would help that situation too. Mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, do you know what other Thanks. towns around us use Power School? London area uses it. Could we connect with them? Hooks it uses it. Bedford <coughs> uses it. Yeah, I, I know mean, it's a lot. It's power school is pretty much a dominant. Progress reports. Could we yeah. see who else is sending progress reports? I can ask around. Mm. I think London is probably the one that's been using it the priority. longest in the area. Follow, probably followed by us then. Well, I'm not sure when Bedford. Bedford didn't go to power school. Bedford came on after. Yeah. After There's a lot of schools. And Hooks that came in on after us too. I think Londonderry is okay. the nearest town that's been using it for a longer period of time than us. Yep, I'll look for it. All right, thanks. All right, we're ready. Wait, we're gonna, I had one oh, more. So <laughs> go right ahead. I, I forgot that I saw your hand up. Yeah, um, I forgot to throw this out for when we were doing the good news and commendations. I wanted to um, let everybody know that Mountain View Partnership will be having uh, a meeting on Wednesday, and everyone is welcome to attend, and our special guest speaker oh. will be Mr. Keith Allard to discuss the <laughs> budget. So I just wanted to let everybody know that that begins at 7 o'clock at the Mountain View Middle School Media Center. And I forgot to put in a request um, to make sure that there was a proxy there for us. Okay, Prox Proxima? Proxima, sorry. Okay. I don't know if you can, if you think about it, are you going to be in the school tomorrow or should I send an email? I can make sure it's not. Oh, okay. W when's the meeting? Wednesday. Tomorrow, Wednesday. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. And how much time is the, uh, are you guys devoting towards it? floor is yours. Okay. I, I've discovered that the question time is actually taking more up than the presentation time. Yeah. And I know, Diane, are you going to be joining me for this one? Wednesday? Wednesday? This is the first I've heard of it. Oh, um. I have. Wait a second. I was, <laughs> I was there when you volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know that you said it to me. I oh. never CC'd you on. Do you want to join me? <laughs> no, and I'm, I'm going with Maple to a Christmas carol. So no, I don't that's know quite all right. We're getting out, and it's oh, this is seven at night. It's a family <laughs> tradition. We go for dinner. That's okay. No, nope. no. But, um, I, 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 I didn't think about seeing, seeing you on and say okay. if you wanted to join me like you did in the other ones. I completely okay. forgot. It's for PNC. I forgot to uh, CC you on it. I'll, I'll try to, to see what I can do here. Uh, know that the high school when they do. The night for um, scholarship night, mm -hmm. we usually go and try to do talk about our budget that night at the high school. Okay. All right. Philip, you have one? I do. Go right ahead. Um, we have an open meeting here. Um, we invite um, any member of the community to come to participate, to listen, to comment publicly. Um, I believe that if you're going to comment publicly, in fairness to anybody who you might comment about, you have a responsibility and a duty to come with information rather than just speech. Um, nobody here would attempt to bar speech or to limit speech. But if you're going to show up, show up with everything. Tell us how many years, tell us how many students, Tell us how many teachers you are talking about. Tell us what the nature of the grievances are. 
um, whether they stem from a year or seven years, from 300 faculty members over a seven year period or two faculty members over a single year period. It is unfair and unreasonable to simply walk in, fire your gun off in a crowded theater and exit without having to be held accountable. So in fairness to anybody who might be present in the room, um, and I include myself in that group um, because I really am making the demand, if you will come <coughs> as a member of the public and you have an agenda or something that you choose to speak to, bring with you the evidence. Present the evidence. Um, or tell us ahead of time. Um, or send it to us. But being able to just sort of walk in the door and fire off the gun seems incomplete. So I would ask that um, to the public this evening, that if there are specific issues and if there is specific evidence that the public was making reference to, to produce that evidence. Um, the school board would be interested in seeing the evidence and having all of the information, which would include the span of time that the public made reference to, the items specifically, the decisions over those items, identifying the source of the issues that were brought um, and talking about the parameters, which are, again, the number of people involved in aggregate over the entire time frame, um, the number of students involved in aggregate over the entire time frame, and then maybe, and only then, maybe the board can begin to appreciate the public comments. Okay. We're going to jump right on to nominations. We Hold have... on. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Lori. I would just like to make note that the public comment did produce information that anyone who would like to from the board could speak directly to the source as opposed to secondhand information. That's not evidence. And if they gave the evidence, would you believe it as well, or would you want from the source? The, 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 when somebody comes from the public and speaks and puts on a presentation and simply fires off their gun without any evidence, and that is not evidence, I didn't see documents, I didn't see framework, I didn't see anything, that's irresponsible. Because it suggests a conclusion that the speaker would wish to articulate as opposed to the evidence. If there's evidence that is worthy of discussion, certainly it's something that we could look at. But to be perfectly honest, I don't know of anything that came out tonight other than insinuation that suggests that anything that was said has anything to do with anything that is before us at this time. So in fairness to this body, if you're going to do something like that that begs a conclusion and then say, okay, now that I've done that, now it's your responsibility to go get the evidence. You probably need to think twice about what you're speaking of without presenting the evidence. That's all. And that's a fair point. It's my opinion, okay? It is not a fact. It is my opinion, which obviously I hold pretty dearly. <laughs> um, but given that it begs a conclusion and seeks to make a point without doing anything other than speaking, it's without evidence. And you don't then take the burden and shift it to somebody else to refute by finding evidence. That's unreasonable. It's unfair. I mean, we can talk about it all night if you'd like. Yes, but I'm I, sure but we I don't think wanna I'm just thinking the last time we get evidence, then it gets pulled from the board and they don't need to review it and stuff like that. We've had, it, we've had things go both ways and the public is allowed to say what they want. I'm not saying they aren't allowed to say what they want. Nobody you're, you're said that. You're suggesting that they don't. No, I'm suggesting that if you're going to come and beg a conclusion and state something as if it is fact that leads to a conclusion, it is your responsibility as a member of the public to provide 
evidence and you simply don't solve your problem of not providing evidence by saying, now you go find something to refute it, which is essentially the position that was articulated today. And that's not fair, nor is it reasonable. Disagree, but we're going to just have to end up disagreeing. All right, I understand no, that. we don't want to get into an argument. I don't want any fist fights afterwards. Oh, they're not going to be. <laughs> so, nominations. Um, I just have uh, two student teacher notifications. Um, Karen Lovett will be working at the high school with uh, Christina Philibot Howard in the English department, and Dana Spinner will be working with Sandy Nichols in the art department. Um, and then we have three co curricular volunteers just to inform you of um, all wrestling, all volunteers at the high school Ryan Hardy, Nicholas Frank Poor, and Richard. Alas Chavez. So they're just notifications. Excellent. And we actually need to go to non public um, to discuss personnel matters as well as do the superintendent's evaluation because we need to submit that to the SAU chair. Um, I think the deadline is the 20th of December. So I'm actually trying to hit the deadline this year <laughs> rather than be late. So, so this way that Joe can move ahead and. Uh, Take care of doing his evaluation on time with Stacy. I think Dun Martin's done, so you guys are behind the ball. Yeah. And I think New Boston, don't they have on their next agenda or <laughs> yes. something like that? So, you know, we got to hurry up and get it done before we're uh, too late. Um, so, if I can have a motion to go into non public um, by Ginny, seconded by Hank, I'm just going to do a roll call. Yes, yes, yes. yes. All right, we're officially in non public. We'll just take a quick one minute recess so Dick can uh, break so down and shut off the equipment. Well, normally they just shut everything off. Um, yeah, if you can just send us, we'll fill in the blanks. Oh, yeah. that's right.